welcome to the Pro-Life Team Podcast. I'm here with Joan, who is going to speak to us about self-care and the need for self-care today. And, um, and even though it may, this is something we've, we've needed over the long term, uh, it seems even more present and more needed today than it has been in previous years. <laughs> Would you tell me a little bit about who you are? Um, what's your, if you were to introduce yourself to an executive director or several executive directors, how might you introduce yourself when it comes to where you've been and what you do? Okay. I'm very pleased to walk alongside you as you do your work in a pregnancy center. Um, I started working in pregnancy centers a long time ago and served as an executive director for 20 years. And during that time, I also became a consultant for CareNet and I have continued with that role. So I talk to people on the phone or get emails all the time from directors and client services directors and um, other people who work in the center who want to talk and get quest answers to their questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to uh, self-care, um, how would you describe the impact or the need that a director has or their team might have for, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for self-care? Like what's the importance and how, what's the effect? You know, the, it's important all the time because uh, we're working with people who have great needs and that can be very taxing for those who are helping them. Um, there's an excitement, there's a, a, a satisfaction in helping, but there's also a lot of pressure and a lot of drain. And so one of the things that we have to encourage people to do is be sure that they have resources for caring for themselves, not just for their clients. You know the old thing, when you get on a plane, don't put a mask on your child first, get your own mask on, because if you're not mm, that's good. taking care of yourself, you're not able to help well, that makes take a lot care of, of sense. others. Yeah. Um, I talked to a director recently who was just so overwhelmed with the pressures at home, especially during this pandemic time, the pressures at work, the pressures at home, and uh, she just finally had to take a 24-hour break where she went away by herself and cut all communication. Didn't, mm. didn't watch any screens, didn't listen to any phones, but just to refresh, did a lot of walking outside. and. Um, Different things work for different people, but it's important to be caring for yourself. And yeah, that brings up a good topic of what are some examples of self-care? So breaking away from uh, the center work for a period, um, getting outdoors. Can be helpful. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, so can you share more examples? Or? Well, uh, different things um, bring pleasure to different people in terms of somebody just needs to sit down and read a book mm -hmm. that is not referring to the intensity of the work. Somebody needs to go out and laugh, do something that's fun. Mm. Maybe go roller skating, I, I don't know, but different kinds of things that people do in order to um, lift themselves up. Okay, mm -hmm. that's really good. And of, of course, there's this huge spiritual component um, that if we're not being fed spiritually, uh, we you can't keep giving out and giving out if there's not mm -hmm. taking in. There's um, one, one of the gentlemen at my church, was, he's a, um, oh, it was a, a, a chaplain. At, he was a chaplain at a hospital. And, and so what would happen is that people, when, they, when people pass away in a hospital situation like the ER, it's, it's unexpected. It's, it's people don't want that person to pass away. They haven't prepared at all. It's all very sudden. And so as a chaplain, he would often find himself working in the hardest situations mm -hmm. because he would be working with people who were angry, very emotional, mm -hmm. um, under a lot of stress that all just showed up in a short period of time. And what the result was is that he was sort of like a warrior on the front line being battled and mm -hmm. being beaten and bloodied and he needed to have self-care and he wasn't getting the self-care and so it was, he ended up so today he works in a different situation. He's working as a chaplain at a, um, for, for people who are experiencing end of life, mm -hmm. end of, the end of life scenario. And mm -hmm. so it's a, it's, a, it's a much different situation where people 
know they're in the final chapter mm -hmm. and, and they're trying to find peace and it's still difficult, but it's nowhere near as difficult as the ER styled mm -hmm. chaplain. Um, you know, I, I wrote a book recently and it talks about different situations that people face, especially in pregnancy care ministry. And one of the things that um, uh, I share in there is a personal thing. I had to drive quite a distance to get to my center. Okay. And I found that that was actually a good thing in many ways because as I was leaving and coming home, oh. uh, most of the time, I didn't do this very well all the time, I was able to use that time to kind of unpack the day and bring my thoughts to the Lord, uh, mm. think about the clients and pray for them and then put them to rest for the night and not carry that home uh, with me and so that I could enjoy my family. And one of the sadnesses um, is that you know people who are not going home to a pleasant environment, mm. who are not going home to a place where there are people who love them and will receive them. Um, maybe not going home preparing a, a nutritious meal, but finding something scattered in the cupboard that they could open to eat just because they don't have the same supply of food. So there's that kind of mm. pressure that can be very, uh, can really weigh someone down. And there's no way to avoid that when you're working with troubled people day after day, hour after hour. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the experience that we've all had recently with the pandemic is, um, you know, we went through this period and we adjusted to it. And I was so amazed that pregnancy centers did such a good job of still seeing their clients, of still making a way, of coming up with creative ways to serve. But we thought we were coming out of it. And now uh, people are feeling like, is this going to ever end? Yeah, it, it feels it's like dragging a, on. Yeah, there's a new cycle on the horizon and uh, some of those uh, anxieties are Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, on the, on the <laughs> looking to come back. Right. And, uh, one of the things that's part of self care is I think we need to talk about our troubles, talk about our anxieties, um, hmm. express those concerns, and find safe people to do that with. And that may be director to director, um, uh, staff to staff, you know, where you can say, let's talk about what's troubling us, let's bring it out in the open. And uh, to be good. praying for each other is huge, huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I used to work at a pregnancy clinic as a publishing manager, every morning <clears throat> we would start the day with, uh, with prayer. And at first I thought it was really nice, but then I realized it was more like a necessity mm -hmm. because it, this mm -hmm. was a spiritual space with spiritual warfare going on and not just simply, we're, we weren't just doing it, you know, I, I eventually learned we weren't just doing it as a, as a good discipline, but we were doing it more of out of it's, it's so necessary to be able to have long-term work. If work in that space for a, a long period requires ongoing prayer throughout everything because there's, every, there's attacks that show up in the details. Right. And then right. God can show up in the details too. And so there's a lot of it's in the details more so than the bigger pieces, it seems uh, like. People talk about things like pop-up prayer or instant prayer or whatever. And so it's great to pray as a team when you can. Uh, but then throughout the day, you know, taking one person aside said, let's pray. I just had a difficult <laughs> session. Um, you know, we don't have to share the details. We can protect confidentiality, but that was a really hard session. And I need, I need some refreshment right now. Okay. Maybe it's opening the door <clears throat> and going for a short walk. Yeah. Um, maybe it's going and buying an ice cream cone in the middle of the day or something to, to just break that um, endless pressure. Mm -hmm. There was a, at my church, they recently had a sermon about um, spending time with Jesus, like not just going, a walk, going on a walk for exercise, but going on a walk with Jesus and talking to him as if he was really there, because he is really there, but actually like, you know, talking to him right. And, right. and doing it for, a, you know, essentially like, you know, going on a, mm -hmm. a walk with Jesus more so than doing it for some mm -hmm. other purpose. You yeah. know, a, a phrase from a sermon that I heard recently was, look like Jesus and look like Jesus. <laughs> and the point being, if you look at other people the way Jesus looks at other people mm. and the way Jesus looks at you, then you begin to look like Jesus to those people. To your, you see who he is and it makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. I titled my book, My Mother Will Kill Me, My Father Will Die, which is kind of a strange title. Mm. But the point is, that it, um, it has a subtitle, Seeds of Shame, Harvest of Hope. 
because um, we have, um, I've heard those, I have heard clients say those things. They're under such tremendous pressure. And so you can imagine the people who are working with those clients are feeling that pressure too of how do I help this woman? Yeah, the, the pressure so to abort. Desperate. The pressure of um, uh, mm. the shame if I tell my mom it's going to be terrible or my dad's going to be really upset and disappointed. Right, right. And so they, they take on all that shame when and then mm -hmm. and then make a decision that hurts everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whereas that shame needs to be... How, how would you describe what needs to happen to that shame? When that, that shame is present, what, what needs to happen next? What happens next is I think the, fir the first step is the relief of being able to say that in a safe place. Okay. And then helping somebody bring down the pressure and recognize that you take a step at a time. Um, as somebody said, you know, you don't unpack every suitcase at the same moment. You, you look at, well, let's see, what is the, what is the top most mm -hmm. thing that's causing difficulty right now? How your parents are going to feel about this? Um, have you talked to your parents? What kind of situations can you talk to your parents about? And so on. And bringing, bringing down the uh, intensity. Um, what are, what's going to happen to my schooling? What am I going to do about a job? What if my boyfriend yeah. leaves me? And just unpacking and doing a piece at a time okay. instead of thinking we have to solve oh, everything at really once. really good. I mean, it makes it into a taking one bite at a time instead of trying right. to take too, too large of a, an right. amount on. Right, mm -hmm. um, So in Tucson, there was this clinic on the, there a clinic with three locations. The, the Crisis Pregnancy Centers of Tucson, now it's Hands of Hope, but they used to have a location in the worst part of town and they had other locations in better parts of the city or you know, less poverty stricken and, or more normal, I guess. Um, and the, 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 the location that was in the poverty stricken area, it had a high turnover rate of volunteers because people had more, more suitcases of hardships. Mm -hmm. They would have, mm -hmm. you know, so they might mm -hmm. be illegal um, from Mexico. They might be, it might, maybe there's drugs or addiction. There might be an abusive boyfriend or an abusive relationship involved. And whereas the, the, the unplanned pregnancies in Midtown were, they might have one or two problems. The ones on the South side would have three, four or five problems. And maybe they didn't even speak English and there was a whole different level right, of issues. Right. And what would you say to, to volunteers who are experiencing hard clients that have five suitcases of baggage? Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, Revisiting the idea of doing one suitcase at a time, or how else would you how else would you appro approach mm -hmm. that? Well, uh, one thing that I think is essential across the boards is really good training. Okay. Really, really looking at what the situations could be, and how do you approach them, and getting good training and good supervision, um, and it's it's constantly retraining. Um, I, I one thing that I would good. say is that the the element of shame. Um, will affect both of those populations. It shows up in different ways. You're right, that in one section, they don't have to worry about going home and not having food. Uh, and they probably don't have to worry about a place to live unless That's the parents right. are threatening and to that throw a, them out, yeah, which is usually just a threat. Yeah, on the south side, they, might not, they may just be here without even a place to stay. And they, yeah, what if, if they're homeless? That's another, another luggage piece right, that's right. weighing down on them. Right, Definitely. so that's, that's particularly difficult. And it's hard for most of the people who are doing volunteering um, or are working in a pregnancy center are not under those personal pressures themselves. So how do you cross the bridge to help someone who's in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think it's good when people feel like they're, they're being heard and known. And so by just simply being there to listen to all of their suitcases is, is a way to start, perhaps. We underestimate the power of listening. And um, that, that's the biggest key. If we can listen, um, we have a course at CareNet we call Connecting Conversations. And it's helping to go deeper into the understanding of how you listen and empathize with somebody so that you can feel what they're feeling. And that breaks it open for the other person. It doesn't solve everything. It doesn't, you know, it's not like waving a magic wand, but it, it's the key that begins to open the, mm. uh, the process. And of course, you know, our desire is to share the love of Jesus with people um, with permission. 
uh, not, not pushing our agenda, but showing them the love of God through our actions, through our deeds, through our words, and with our supported by our prayers. That's mm. huge. Well, my, my favorite verse in the Bible is uh, James 15, 6. Currently, that's my favorite verse. And it goes, um, uh, <laughs> um, confess, confess your sins one to another so that you, you may be healed, and the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. And if I was to paraphrase it, I would, I would say the prayers of a righteous woman or man <laughs> availeth much. And, um, but I would say that you know, sharing stories and then asking for prayer, I think it provides healing out, you know, beyond traditional sins. It also provides healing, I think, for hardships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, then, um, and so I think that invites people to share mm -hmm. and that invites people to find healing and it invites people... Um, to seek that experience of mm -hmm. sharing and healing. Mm -hmm. um, because if it can work for sin, it can work for, you know, hardships. Mm -hmm. and, I, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, I think that makes, that seems very reasonable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's beautiful. And I think that maybe that's a really important way to look, because uh, yeah, um, and maybe that verse does speak to sharing and speaking things out and then asking for prayer mm -hmm. through hard situations. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was reflecting with a couple of directors this morning even that um, there used to be a time when if a woman in the church became pregnant, um, she was often brought before the board of elders, sometimes had to confess to the whole church her sin and how damaging that could be because in fact the man involved usually didn't have to speak up at all mm. and uh, some people were asked to leave churches because of that God said we're all sinners and he doesn't say okay this that kind of very sin humiliating you or, go over there yeah. and the rest of us are okay that's not the way he's, he's speaking with huge love and compassion yeah I, I think it works well when it's a small group of trusted um, of people you trust and who care, truly care and love you, mm -hmm. um, then to speak and share and ask for prayer is, is safe. And it's not- A safe place. It's not mm -hmm. marking you with a large A. It's, mm -hmm. it's essentially, it's asking God for healing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with people you would consider family outside of your normal, you know, your church family. Yes. Or, yes. or yeah, good friends, mm -hmm. trusted friends. And that's what I think uh, pregnancy centers are full of. People who are, have that compassion, have that call in their lives to be there for people in this difficult situation. So. Yeah, and I think it's really good that it, it, this, apply, this, you know, this self care idea, you know, for the director and, and the, the, the pregnancy clinic team of, of staff and volunteers and the medical team. Um, yeah, that's, it's just, it's good because we want, we, we're in this for the long run. This is not a, you know, we're, we're, you know, in 50 years, women, you know, unless Jesus comes back, women will still be needing help with unplanned pregnancies. You know, when Roe versus Wade gets overturned, unplanned pregnancies will still need to be addressed and helped. You know, women and men will be, you know, will need help then, just like today, just like in, you know, 20 years ago. This, and so we want to make sure that we're, taking good care of, of people serving because we need to grow our group, not have it, you know, have burnout or, or just, you know, shrink right. based off of um, people having turnover because they came, they became overwhelmed because they couldn't help with all the luggage, but we just want to help with one piece at a time. Right. And some centers actually provide for sabbaticals for okay. their directors um, after a number of years to give them, um, whether it's a couple of weeks or a month or even longer to um, move away from the center in a sense of refreshing themselves, doing yeah. something that's going to be restorative to them. And yeah. we can do that with our volunteers too. Um, occasionally celebrating things, that, celebrating events, <coughs> um, having uh, small retreats that are refreshing and fun, uh, as well as instructive in order to um, encourage the whole staff. How would you speak to having like the full armor of God on and maybe still needing rest and, and recovery, even with the armor of God. Oh, and also speak maybe to like the importance of the armor of God in this mm -hmm, situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I think there are all kinds of things that come into attack 
um, this work because it's, uh, the enemy is not happy with uh, pregnancy centers and pregnancy work. So the uh, instruction of scripture to have the full armor of God is exceedingly important. Um, and uh, we go through the pieces and you know just see that each one is a value. Uh, but the, as I've understood it in the past, the armor is on because you're moving forward into the work, um, not moving backwards, and you're not yeah. turning your back to run. Self-care isn't turning your back to run. Self-care is shoring up the defenses and refreshing the spirit mm -hmm. so that you can keep moving forward. Yeah, and I think they pair well together. I don't think it's a matter of, you know, mm -hmm. without the armor of God, self-care, you know, you'll need it so much quicker, <laughs> very, very quickly. But with the armor of God, I still think self-care and rest, because I think God often calls us in the rest and that's mm -hmm, part of, mm -hmm. you know, part of the message of the Bible is to find rest in Jesus, oh, nice. rest in God, you know, give our burdens to Him. There's lots of rest messages, and I think that pairs really well with going into battle and then finding rest afterwards. Yes. Um, yes. So you can return to battle when needed, and so that's part of, I think that's part of the, the calling. Um, well, I really appreciate your time, and I hope that... You're welcome. Well, before we wrap this up, though, who would you say your book is really helpful to when it comes to the audience? Like, is this made for executive directors and counselors and volunteers who are talking to women and dealing with the shame piece in this, their... I, this is the, the primary target of the book, the primary audience, is those okay. who work in caregiving to others, primarily in the pregnancy center, but in other situations in life too. Um, by sharing our own stories, by being vulnerable ourselves and understanding the kind of pressure that's on the people who are hurting. I think that's the key, and that was my desire. To, awesome. And this podcast is primarily for executive directors and their teams and people who are interested in the pro-life mm -hmm. uh, world or efforts. Mm -hmm. and, and so this will definitely speak to, you know, this book would be really helpful probably as something to encourage people who are experiencing difficulty trying to trying to fight you know, the, right. the barbs of shame, you know, those, those uh, arrows of shame that are being yes. shot. Uh, this would be a way to probably address and understand more about how to deal with those. If anybody wants more information about the book, they can go to my website, which is... Um, Let's see, where is your website address? <laughs> we need to look at the marketing materials here. Let's see. It's, it's, um, oh, wait, it's on this one. It's right. www.lifespan.center. That's right. <laughs> My team worked on that. I should. I was thinking it was a different website address, <laughs> and I should have known. Oh, what, yes. Can I? Yes. There's one aspect of Joan's book that's really important for this subject. You know, as Joan's husband, and having had almost 56 years of married experience with her, I know a little bit about some of the challenges mm -hmm. that caregiving people have. And as a person who has done a lot in his own career and uh, life, uh, I understand how important results are to me. And yet in this work of dealing with people and their needs, it's uh, sometimes we don't get any clues about what the results of our efforts on their behalf have. So having to uh, give up the comfort of knowing that such and such a person didn't have an abortion after all, or have a person was able to resolve their family issues or their business mm -hmm. issues, uh, that can be hard. You say, you know, what's the fruit of my labors? Every once in a while, God gives us a few clues or evidences of how he's used me and Joan in serving him and other people. But often we don't get that kind of evidence. We have to trust him that he who has directed us to do a certain mm -hmm. thing with our life uh, have just been obedient to him. I was going to say it's a matter of obedience and one illustration I used is that it's like um, there are certain times when you're called to get on the train and you ride for a distance and there are other people with you on the train but at some stop you're called to get off and other people get on and some people ride on and so if we're doing our part and following through with what we're supposed to be doing in God's eyes. Um, it, it, that's, but we don't always know. Is that person going to get on or off at the next stop? And uh, what impact have we had? And that's, as I look back, you know, there are lots of clients that I, I know that some had their babies. I know that some had abortions, but there are those that 
I don't know about. And I probably never will until the Lord shows me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems like the, um, you can rest in the fact that God's in control and that you're, yeah, if you're listening to Him, mm -hmm. that's the best you can do. Right. By obeying Him. Right. Mm -hmm.